where did you start with the dialogue? What kind of got you thinking, this is where, this is the dialogue I need? I think just, I start to think about the character and what, you know, what kind of guys these people are. And, you know, Ben's character is just a relatable guy. I mean, he, yeah. you know, you think he's maybe making jokes and trying, right. trying too hard. Yeah. You know, he's trying to impress. But I mean, to, it, to me, a lot of that just came from, you know, you just think, what would a normal guy do in this circumstance? Yeah. Well, you love him because he's game. He, he's game for anything to a point. He's trying so hard. He's trying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I find in movies, when a character's trying, you're on their side. Right. You know, if he's just a dickhead and like, I don't care about pleasing your family and they're assholes, you know, you, right. you, you don't really care as much. But he really wants to succeed. Did and so you, I think you yeah. want what he wants. Did you always have him come out in a little tiny bikini uh, bathing suit? That, I think in the script that I, that I uh, worked on, it was, I think that was a, okay. a really nice moment in the script. Now, where did the circle of trust come from? The circle of trust came from talking to De Niro and he was talking about some of his CIA contacts and I remember going home, I worked at home at that time, uh, and just having this idea that this guy would have something like called a circle of trust. That's like, what does it mean? I mean, I can't explain it to this day, but I know that I've talked to people who were like, now in my family, we have a circle of trust. I'm like, so that means you don't all lie to each other all the time? Like what, you know? Right. But I just thought this guy would have something that's his family's you know, code of honor. Mm -hmm. And the, I, the phrase just, came to me. I mean, maybe the first thing was circle of, right. I don't even know what, circle of life <laughs> right. from the Lion King. Well, it certainly became such a touchstone. I remember in, when the Universal execs were developing the sequel, you know, everybody was like, okay, the problem is we got to get him out of the circle of trust. How do we get Ben out of the circle right, of trust to right. get him back in the circle of trust? It really became the headline for the It's interesting. I mean, story. it's very, I got to say, it's very satisfying because you write this stuff, you don't know right. if it's going to work at all or anything, and suddenly it becomes... It's, it's something that you just made up and then it becomes like a thing, mm -hmm. you know, and in, in the, yeah, in the sequel, you know, there's literally that graphic that I, I didn't come up right. with the, some writers before me of, you know, a circle and then Ben on the outside <laughs> of the circle. And it's very, you know, you're kind of like, right. that's cool, you know. How does this scene further their relationship in terms of, you know, like, where do they, how, how did it help you take them from that point forward? Well, I think you go, okay, this isn't just going to be some unspoken conflict between them. This is going to be a war. Mm -hmm. And where is a war going to go? So I think it sets up like then they go to Owen Wilson's character's house and suddenly there's all this tension there because the family goes, oh, we're, aren't we having a good time? But Ben Stiller is going, this guy basically just attacked me, threatened to bring me down to Chinatown. I don't know <laughs> even what that entails right. going down there. But I think it informs tension in the rest of the in the rest of the movie. So and it raises the stakes there. It raises the stakes. And I think, you know, then right. it can escalate and, and culminate in their sort of low speed car chase. Yes, that's the perfect payoff for that scene. Where they, it's yeah. the payoff because now Ben can go to De Niro, I'm watching you, because right. he thinks he has something on De Niro. That's the big, it's on now. See? It's on, <laughs> yeah. So I think it, it sets up that kind of, you know, that runner, which is this thematic element of a private war between right. the two guys. And of course, when you have a private war, you, in this kind of movie, you have to come to a, a peaceful resolution to right. it, and that's what you know the scene at the at the airport is. Now, did you uh, write De Niro's hand gesture into the script, or was that something that you guys came up with during shooting? I, I believe <laughs> yes, I, I believe I did write it in. Okay. Um, I don't want to take credit for something that it, maybe Jay Roach will watch this and go, dude, you didn't write that. But I do remember, I think Jay's I wrote too it. nice to even do yeah, that. Yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. right. I do remember, I think, writing that because I remember us, or Jay, sitting down with De Niro and saying to him, you know, this, you know, you're basically going to go, I'm watching you. And I remember De Niro at first, maybe he didn't get exactly the thing. Really, I think he was just messing with us. Right. Because he was sort of like, this? And we're like, no, no, it's this. You know, it's that military thing. Right. And he was like, I know. <laughs> right. I'm smarter man, than all of you. The man must have, I mean, given his filmography, he must have absorbed more research on every topic than anybody else. He knows understand. everything. Right. So he was, he was toying with us. Most of what you've done kind of has been with in collaboration or, or for Ben Stiller. Can you describe that kind of working relationship for us? Yeah, it's, um, you know, I mean, the thing that I love about Stiller is that he's the most passionate, driven guy I've ever worked with. And it's always 
just how can we make it better? How can we make it better? You know, and so we've worked in different ways. I mean, Meet the Parents was really, I was mainly working with Jay Roach at the beginning, and then Ben would come in, and he has very good instincts about his character, and obviously he's a good writer, so he can mm -hmm. come up with lines and ideas, and then you kind of go off and, and I write them, or somebody else writes them, right. and bring them back. And you know, something like Zoolander was more a lot of talking, and sometimes we'd be in the room writing stuff together, but uh, you know, a lot of times it was, you know, we'd talk for a long time or sit in a hotel room and riff on ideas, mm -hmm. and then I'd go off and work and you know, bring it right. back to him, and he has ideas. And then something like Along Came Polly was a little different, because that was really, the script was pre pretty much done. So it was just going through the scenes and making sure they were as good as they could be, and mm -hmm. tracking the character, and he asks a lot of questions. He's very demanding, right. you know, so you're always trying to make it better and better, and trying to make it, if it's supposed to be real, trying to make it real, and why would this character react this way? He doesn't just want to go for the joke. Right. Which I think is great. I think he and I both love character-based comedy, mm -hmm. and that you know so many of his movies, I think, are just like have that quality. Yeah, they have that quality, and that's I think he's so gifted at like relatable right. comedy. That you know he's the everyman, right. and I I happen to love that in movies as well. So, do you ever draw inspiration from from the things around you, or just if you see it? And uh, object or people or places, do you ever get inspired by just like, you know, what you'll see walking down the street at any given time? Uh, yeah, sure, often. Oh, well, I, good, because I do. we have a screenwriting exercise for you. We've reached the point uh, oh, yeah? in, our, in our little dialogue where we, uh, we have an exercise called the object. Frederick, can we get that tray? So let me explain to you how this works. This is Frederick. How are you? So on the tray there's an object, uh, very carefully chosen by us, but uh, to you it's just random. You, once it's revealed, you, t you make up a story about it. You tell me the story, then I ask you how you came up with that particular story. I'm really nervous. All right. Frederick, can you reveal the object? Your object, sir. Thank you, Frederick. May I take this, please? Oh, yes. OK. Of course, all comedy comes from a meat <laughs> thinner. Uh, you sure this wasn't from one of those drama guys you had in here? Oh, no, you should see what they've gotten. <laughs> OK. All right, so you want me to come up with a story. Yeah, and by the way, it doesn't have to be gone with the wind. It can be something, it can be something pithy, something brief, whatever, whatever pops into your head. What do you call these things again? Meat tenderizer. Meat tenderizer. Mm -hmm. All right, well, this, where my mind went to. And it's great. We'll see how your mind works, which is really yeah, the most constructive part Yeah, I don't know what the hell I'm yeah. going to say. OK. My mind went to. A guy is having a first date with a girl he has a crush on, and he doesn't cook that much. Uh, and so he is making a chicken milanesa, and she's coming over, and he's pounding away, and she comes over, and he uh, is so, he's talking to her, and he doesn't, he's, you know, they're having a glass of wine, and he's slamming away, and uh, at one point slams his hand. <laughs> and starts to tenderize his hand, but doesn't want to indicate to her that he's... Made a mistake. Made a mistake, <laughs> not quite the stud that he is. Right. So he just continues to pound <laughs> away gently, and uh, he gets more and more red in the face, <laughs> and then comedy ensues. <laughs> <laughs> he probably passes out. He passes out, and uh, she looks and you know, reveals that, sees his hand, and he's got these pock marks uh, <laughs> all over his hand. And then she sees how committed he was to their relationship, that she ends up going with him to the emergency room, where they explain to the doctor that he tenderized his hand. And the movie is called The Tenderizer. <laughs> well, that's great. I think that's awesome. That is what it is. Uh, and I'm going to go set it up. Uh, <laughs> At First of all, you pitched a scene that I'm sure if it was actually in a movie would make every trailer and every TV, TV spot. That's a very, yeah, very funny Yeah, it'd be like, you know, Billy Paul <laughs> loves Shannon Elizabeth. Well, well you know, she's a real anytime a meat, a meat tenderizer can hit a, a hand and, that, and you can't let on, that's making yeah. it into every trailer and TV oh, spot. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Not only, it, first of all, you do that and then you test screen the movie <laughs> and then they'd go, that tenderizer seems hysterical. What if at the end... Can you reprise it? Yeah, they're getting married and he goes, wait, 
I want to make the asabuka or whatever. <laughs> and so he goes like that, That's great. tenderizes his hand, and suddenly you're scoring in the 90s at your preview, and we no, can I all see, I see you went again. to uh, some of your themes about regular guys and, and mistakes you make and kind of getting boxed into a corner. What went into your choosing that, that particular story? Because I think it's an awesome story. Thank you. Um, I'm a one-trick pony, DeLuca. <laughs> That's it. You know, give me a normal guy, insecure. Uh, I don't, you know, I just... That's, that's. Is that why you went to it? Kind of like you know, you always try to find the the a mistake all of us could make. And right. To. Yeah, I just thought, okay, well, you know, I've been I've tenderized my share of meat, <laughs> right? Uh, and it's and it, you know, you are always like I where my mind goes is the worst possible thing that could happen. Gotcha. I don't consciously do it. It's just that's where I go. Right. So I'm thinking if I am tenderizing meat. There's a good chance, I'd say 36, 37%, that when I'm doing it, I might slam my hand. <laughs> right. And so then I'm like, that, you know, it's a drama if I'm tenderizing the meat right. and go, so, how was your day today? <laughs> I think it's a comedy if you do right. it and... Uh, and I love that your guy can't let on. He's can't so let on. earnest in his desire so, to have yeah, a relationship. Yeah, he's like, so, how you, how you doing? How's your job? Yeah, you wear, you, so you work in a secretary <laughs> pool. Right. So you wear sneakers to work and then you change into pumps? <laughs> or how do you do that? You know, it's like, Very he's cool. just going. Very Will cool. would be very good in the tenderizer. I feel it. You're, I know you're going to go set it up. Let's go make an show. offer. <laughs> yeah. If you know you're writing for a certain budget, does that affect your writing? And then when you're shooting, are you precious about what you've written, or is it really is it really two different hats? And are you able to yeah. change hats? Is that cliche true? You know, when I'm writing, I don't think that much about the budget or I just try to write the movie okay and I picture the movie in my mind mm -hmm. and that's really all I'm trying to do right I don't I, you know I'm not thinking a studio is not gonna make this because right. it's too big or that seems too big. I'm just like what's the best thing I can do okay but it's very interesting like then I'm directing and you go or you're, you're going through the schedule and pre-production and you go this scene that I spent months on we're gonna have four hours to do it and that's it and it's like, it's, we're never gonna get another chance. It's, it's really an interesting thing, because when you're writing, it's all possibility. And then when you're directing, it's reality. Mm. And you just try to desperately make it better than you saw it you know, right. on the page. Can you give us an example of, of a scene that was great on the page when you were writing, but became a production nightmare when you had to shoot it? Yeah, the, in Along Came Polly, we did a read through of the script, and one of the funniest scenes was when Ben Stiller's playing basketball and with his buddy, Philip Seymour Hoffman, mm -hmm. And they're talking, and two guys come up, and one you know takes his shirt off and is hairy and sweaty. So I'm writing it, it's a funny scene. Cast Ben Stiller, and suddenly there's a reality that first of all these guys have to play basketball all day long. Right. I mean Ben and Philip Seymour Hoffman have to be, you know, running around three cameras, take after take in the hot LA sun. Right. How long would a scene like that particularly? You know, how long would it take to shoot? Without whole scene was a day of shooting. Wow. So, you know, for all the dialogue and all the basketball and a lot, you know, a lot of it was just letting them go play basketball. They just were in character playing and right. doing, you know, a lot of it came from that. But then you go, okay, well, I've written a hairy, sweaty guy rubs up against Ben Stiller's face in slow motion. So first of all, you got to have a guy like Ben Stiller who's willing to do this. Right. I hired the hairiest guy I could find. Right. I mean, try, you know, it's auditioning a guy and going, right. I was like a porn director. I was like, can you take your shirt right. off? So that please? was the Daniel Baldwin cameo. That was the, yeah, exactly. I mean, it was like, you know, the guy comes in, shirt off, please, done. You're our guy. And then 13 takes of a sweaty guy on a trampoline, literally <laughs> rubbing Ben Stiller, sucking So you didn't his, spray this guy down. This is a actual, little bit. A little bit. Okay. Not a lot. Yeah, I mean, and Ben will tell you yeah. the same thing. So Ben thing. had no. He's not a germaphobe, obviously. <laughs> I could never have done it. Right. I mean, but he, he wasn't happy to do it. But that's, He committed. He committed. I mean, that's the beauty. You know, so we do the first three takes. You go, it's almost there. We'd watch it on playback, not, you know, in slow motion, not quite there. And literally 12 or 13 takes, you know, and the 13th take is where the guy's entire, basically his nipple <laughs> is ensconced in Ben's mouth, you know, rubbing up against him. And, but you go, you've got to get it right. Right. You know, and that scene becomes like the scene in the trailer. That, that you scene know, was everywhere, yeah. I'm it was sure. everywhere. It's and at it, NBA games yeah. now. <laughs> you know. Right. It was the only problem with that scene was that so many people had seen it before the movie opened. Right. That, you know, it almost was like, right. when you get, went opening night, they were like, that's, they still laughed, but they were like, right. that's the scene. Is that a challenge when, in terms of marketing when you, you don't want to give away so much yeah. that there's no surprises, but you know that 
that scene will get people to the theater. Yeah, it, it's really tough. I mean, it's, you know, I'm thankful to that scene because it was helpful to have the movie open up and people, you know, go see it because it's right. funny. Have you ever had an actor want, want to change a line that you thought worked just fine and how do you handle that? Yeah, that happens. Um, I mean, a lot of times they're people, when you're the writer and director, they're, they're pretty respectful of like, hey, I, I have this idea for a line, you know, but, it, you know, I don't, they, they usually ask me beforehand. And a lot of times I'll, if, if I think it's better, then great. You know, I'll take a good idea anywhere. Right. If I think it could work, but I'm just not sure, I'll just say, let's do it a few takes that way and a few mm -hmm. takes the way it's written and let's just, right. we'll know at the end what's better. Philip Seymour Hoffman's Sharded has also kind of entered the lexicon. Um, how, how did that come about? And is that cool with you saddling an actor with, you know, I'm sure people roll up on Philip and go, Sharded. <laughs> I know, I know. I mean, you know, am I proud? I, I don't know what Where to did say. that come from? It just was one right. of those things that popped into my head. Okay. I mean, I, you know, other people have since gone, oh, my friends and I made that word up. Right. But my assistant Googled Sharded right. before the movie came out, and there were maybe like, right. there wasn't any hits. Oh, no, I, I believe you invented that for sure. Okay, <laughs> so I don't know. It's just something that came to my mind. I mean, I'm an Ivy League graduate. I'm not proud that that's, <laughs> you know, my legacy right. in American film. But uh, it, it well, just it's came one to, of. It's one of. <laughs> right. It came to my mind. It was, again, to me, it wasn't, oh, let's do a bathroom humor thing. It was like, right. this is real. And every, so many people who came in to audition for the movie they thought they were the only ones, but they said, oh my God, that's happened to me. You right. know, I was at a dinner and so right, it there you happens. Go. It's human, you know I mean? And I, I don't know, the word just popped into my mind one day. Has it been a kick seeing your dialogue spoken by actors like Sam Rockwell and Philip, Philip Seymour Hoffman and De Niro and, and Ben Stiller? It's the best, yeah. I mean, I just feel, you know, I've been very, very fortunate. And you know, it's very joyous days when you're sitting there and listening to and these that. guys say stuff and, and you know the best is like you write it and I do when I'm writing I'm doing bad imitations of all the actors in my mind and then you see these guys and they just there's a reason why De Niro's De Niro and sure. Giamatti and Stiller and Rockwell you know they just elevate it or do it in a way you never could have imagined but it's better and it's yeah it's 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 really a cool thing Aside from yourself, do you ever base characters uh, in your work on other people in your life? Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, always. There's, you know, it, it's more like I take elements of okay. people. There's, you know, elements of somebody who, like, a, like in Along Came Polly, Jennifer Aniston never wanting to commit to a plan and calling up and going, let's make a plan, and by the end going, yeah, so I don't think I'm free tonight. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, there's right. people I know who, they never take it probably that far, but they do do it. You know, and, and there's, there's a lot of people, you know, that you just take one thing. You don't really think consciously, I'm going to steal that aspect of that person. Right. But, you know, you, as a writer, you use what you know. Right. I mean, in my movies have tended to be, except for Zoolander, most of them are grounded in a certain kind of reality right. or relatable world. And so it's, you know, the world around me. Like somebody, one of the producers of Meet the Parents was like, spent some time with my family and was like, now I get it. You know, she <laughs> right. was like, okay, I see where it comes from. In crafting a sequence that goes on as long as, as, as Greg, uh, played by Ben Stiller, looking for that cat, and kind of like the, the almost like a, a Rube Goldberg series of just events that right. go, go wrong all through that sequence, is that something uh, that kind of gets a one line when you're outlining, but then you spend time seeing where you can take it and how far you can take it when you're writing the screenplay? Yeah, I mean, that, I remember that was something that was in the script. That, uh, that Jim Hertzfeld wrote. It was like he lets the cat out. And then I remember, you know, this was a bunch of years ago now, but having a bunch of meetings with the director talking very specifically about what can he do? Right. You know, how does he do it? And, and, and the director is storyboarding and we're kind of talking back and forth. So I think by the time it's shot, it's, it's, it is, I can't remember if in the script it's, it's precisely every beat written out, right. but definitely it's more specifically written out than Greg looks for the cat. Right. Did you plot it out before you started writing it, that particular sequence? Um, or did it just go along with the writing of the script? I think it went along with the writing of the script, but, but then once he started storyboarding, it became, like I remember having phone conversations about, let's figure this thing out in, in greater detail than we have already. Mm -hmm. So by the time you read it, it's pretty much precisely what you're gonna see. And when you're given a rewrite mission, 
Um, is it a specific mission that they tell you that you go off and turn into one task for yourself, or how you know how does that work? Have you gotten conflicting direction if it's a committee, and then you have to distill it all into one kind of reasonable task? Yeah, I mean, a lot of times they go, it's two weeks. It just needs dialogue. Right. And I, from my experience now, I know that it, two weeks yeah. is never two that weeks. That sounds more like a business affairs decision, like just tell them it's two weeks. That's right, yeah, always, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of times the studio will say, it just needs a little dialogue polish, or it just needs a joke. Right. But I've never had that experience. To me, you read the script and everything is interconnected. Dialogue, there's no such thing as just a dialogue polish because like, yeah. it's the characters and the characters inform the action and the structure. Right. It's all interwoven. Yeah. So every rewrite I've done has been everything. Right. You know, because that's what writing is. It's just like everything. Right. I find the movies where there's just like, they bring the dialogue guy in and then they do this, like you can kind of tell. But mm -hmm. I think if you, are successful in doing a rewrite, and sometimes I have been, and sometimes I haven't done it as well as I wanted to. Like, you know, it's just fluid. You mm -hmm. don't go, oh, they clearly brought a guy in. Right. I mean, I, that was Meet the Parents was one of the things I don't think, or Meet the Fockers, where people said it looks like five different guys wrote this. Right. I think it's just like it's the movie, and that's the writing and the directing and the acting. So but, in a way, they come at you thinking it's one task, and as a yeah. writer, you quickly realize. Of course, it's not just about dialogue. It's, it's, there's a larger problem here, and, it, and you have to work up from, at, from the, really the, the basement up through the characters to the dialogue. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I always go, it's the whole thing. Right. And, and like the one I just did, you know, they said, it's two weeks. Right. And I was the one going, that's fine. If you, if you want to make it two weeks, that's great. But to, for me, if you hire me to do the stuff that I think you'd benefit from with the story, it's not. Mm -hmm. I know it's four or five weeks. Right. And it ends up because it's it's hard. Right. Writing is hard. Either right. you know, two weeks maybe you can do a little bit of right. stuff if the script is really there. But you know, usually, a lot of times it needs a bunch of stuff because you keep in educating yourself on what mm -hmm. it needs. How important is uh, discipline to your working habits? Like, do you work off a set schedule for yourself or set goals, or you know, is that is that hard to do? It varies. I mean, when I in my Starting out days, I would just write all the time. Okay. I mean, I'd get up in the morning, write from 9 to 12, then 2 to 4, and then like 5 to 8. You know, I was just, when I think back on it, I was just like a maniac writing all the time. Right. And then it gets, you know, I couldn't keep up that pace. So now it's, I don't, I'm not one of these guys that says three hours a day or four hours a day. I wish I was, because probably my life would be more structured. Right. It just varies. Like some, when I'm writing a first draft, it's like I write like a maniac and I'm writing all the time. And then rewriting, it's in bursts, you know, two hours here and two hours there. Mm -hmm. And then on stuff like the production rewrites, it's just all day, mm -hmm. you know, because you just have to be churning out page after page. And how do you prepare for a pitch if you know you're going in to pitch to people either to sell something or, or just to, to pitch actors? Like, is there a special process to prepare for a verbal pitch? I just, um, I just tell the story mm -hmm. to people. That's really it. I mean, I haven't done that much pitching in my life because um, I don't, I haven't, you know, sold a lot of pitches and set right. it up. I prefer just sort of to write the script. Like on Along Came Polly, yeah, I just told the story to friends, and I wasn't in that great detail because right. um, I was like, just I'll write it. But um, you know, I, I don't ever go. It has to be ten minutes, or it has to be you know, this and that. I just sort of tell the story and think of a few scenes and, you know, tell the story again and again and you become more comfortable telling it. Right. And that's how it works. Do you have any words of advice for, for beginning screenwriters or people that are just kind of starting out? You know, I mean, my, I can only take from my journey. Sure. Basically, I feel like when I was writing to please other people or to please a marketplace that I thought existed, I wasn't successful. Like I started, I started writing when Die Hard was a big movie. So I had an idea of Die Hard in a basketball game, <laughs> which right. they made Die Hard in a the hockey. Right. They I mean, made Die Hard in everything. Everything. So I was right. like, I'm gonna, this is going to be my break, because every, you know, I have this idea. It was called the Twelfth Man. Right. And, and when was the, now? What point in your career was this happening? Okay, this was right after college. Okay, All during right. the PA days so it was before more like, film school. So it was like you were trying to follow the the marketplace. A little yeah. I was going, you know, I'm living at my parents' apartment. I know I want to be a screenwriter right. and director. 
these seem to be selling, I have this idea. And I started writing, and an action movie became a comedy, because that's how my mind worked. Right. And then it just became bad, because like, what is that? Um, so then I, I think once I realized, like, I just have to write what I want to write and what I'm passionate about and leave all that stuff behind, that's when I feel like I started finding my voice as a writer. All you have is your voice, you know, and your unique take on the world as writers. So I just feel like if you can follow that and forget about everything else, that's where you'll achieve success. And it may not be $100 million movies, it just might, you know, success is such a weird term to define, but right. it'll be what you can contribute. As a, as a creative entity. So it's really drawn out the influences right from your heart, right, right what you're passionate about, and not worry about the marketplace? Yeah, right? that's, that's, what I, that's what's mm -hmm. served me. And it, it continues to serve you? I try. I mean, you know, it's, it, look, you, you, you try to tune out the business sure. and all this stuff and just go, what do I want to write? What am I passionate about? Right. What am I going to spend a year working on and right. going, what am I doing? I don't know, you right. know, I'm lost or I'm excited. What's next for you? Next is uh, a movie called The Troubleshooter. That's an original script that I wrote. Uh, I came up with the story with an old friend of mine named Mark Shanahan, okay. and, it's, and then I wrote the screenplay alone. It's a comic mystery thriller uh, about a home theater installation specialist who witnesses a murder and has to go on the run and is very ill-equipped to deal with uh, the situation that he's found himself in. Do you find the spec writing, the spec screenplay process a good one for you? Yeah, I loved it. I mean, I had hadn't done it since Safe Men. And after Meet the Fockers, I was like, I just wanna not deal with anybody else, not deal with a studio, right. just, I just wanna write something and see where it takes me. Right. And so I did, I just had this idea of a comic mystery. I was like, I've never written anything like that, so why, I don't wanna sell it and have the pressure. Mm -hmm. Let me just write it. And it was really liberating, and it was, it was a lot of fun. Oh, great. And then, you know, we just, I'm gonna direct it next fall. Great. We want to thank today's subject, John Hamburg, uh, for joining us. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mike. It was a pleasure. My pleasure. We want to thank you as well for joining us. Please uh, remember to check out our other great interviews in this series with industry pros. And remember, it all starts with you. The next Written by Credit could be yours. I'm Mike DeLuca.